What we're going to open up tonight is a mystery that is over 3,000 years old from the Bible, so big, so precise, so all-encompassing that it lies behind almost everything. It's called the mystery of the Shemitah. It lies behind and is determining the rise and fall of the stock market, the rise and fall of our economy. When collapses happen, the mystery is so big, it, it is behind the rise of nations and the fall of powers, empires, superpowers, the key to when global cataclysms come, the timing of world wars, even the atomic age, the Cold War, 9-11. The rise of America itself and what may be the fall, the past, present, and future. So big I barely had room to put this down in the book. But I'll give you an idea tonight of some of the things that we're going to get talking about the future. Because the next Shemitah, what I call the next Shemitah, is really no longer next. It has just begun. We're at the very beginning. What it might have to do with signs in the heavens. Now I'm careful about date setting, but in the book, I, for the first time I included dates with a caution, but we're going to touch on that. Some of you are hearing this word Shemitah, you have no idea what I'm saying, but it's in the Bible. In the Bible, Leviticus 25, it says you will, you will sow reap for six years, and on the seventh year the, you will rest, the land will rest. It was the Sabbath year. Just like there was a Sabbath day, every seventh day was the Sabbath day, every seventh year was the Sabbath year, and it was called the Shemitah. In that year, an entire year of rest, there was no sowing, no reaping, no plowing of the fields. There was nothing, no buying or selling of the fruits of the land. For an entire year, the purpose was to turn away from the world and turn to God. It was to call the nation back to God. It was to put God first and to declare Him sovereign over all things, and that the land and the blessings belonged to Him, and all the blessings of the nation came from God. And so they would always seek God, or that was the point He called it, but the entire year of rest, but on the last day of the Shemitah, something extraordinary happens. The last day is in the month of Elul, and it's the 29th day. It's called Elul 29. On that day, as the, the Shemitah goes to its peak, all debts are wiped out, all credits wiped out. The financial accounts of the nation are wiped clean. On the day, Elul 29, it's the day of nullification, wipe out of everything financial, and it was to be a blessing. But as Israel turned away from God and went after other gods, the Shemitah becomes, from a sign of blessing, becomes a sign of judgment on a nation that had once known God, but had turned away from God and served other gods and served prosperity and money and gain. And it's a sign of judgment that strikes the nation's blessings, sustenance, prosperity, and even especially starts with the financial realm and economic realm. In the year 586 BC, in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, the Shemitah comes upon Israel in the form of judgment. The armies of Babylon overrun the land. The land is devastated. Jerusalem is destroyed. And the people are removed and taken captive into Babylon. And the prophet Jeremiah is told that the judgment will last 70 years. Why 70 years? Because of the mystery of the Shemitah. In the law, in the Torah, it said when the judgment comes, the land will rest and will observe its Sabbaths. Then the land will rest for all the Shemitahs, or Sabbath years, it did not rest. They broke 70 Sabbath years, or Shemitah. So now God says, I'm gonna, you're going to be removed from the land, from the blessings, and the land will now observe its Sabbaths. So the Shemitah becomes a sign of judgment that even affects the rising and fall of nations, and specifically affects the timing of judgment. The Shemitah transformed the economic realm. It affected the production, labor, trade, commerce, the, fi the financial realm, everything. Now God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is it possible that this Shemitah, this mystery, this pattern of the Shemitah could still be affecting our lives even today? That God could speak through it, 
that God could use its pattern to show his fingerprints. He wove the seventh day into the week, we, all over the world. Could he have woven the seventh year? And could this at times become a sign of judgment? Could this mystery that begins on Mount Sinai when God gives it through Moses be affecting our lives from the day we were born, every moment of our life? Remember, the Shemitah affects the economic realm, the financial realm. Now in modern times, if you have economic cessation, ceasing, or the cessation, people out of work, depression or recession, if you have a wiping out of the financial realm, we call it a collapse, a financial collapse or a stock market crash where accounts are wiped out, can be in a moment. Now here, now listen, in the last 40 years, there have been five major long-term financial collapses. Wall Street reaches the peak and then begins a long collapse. Five of them. They happen in these years, 1973, 1980, 1987, 2000, 2007. Now remember the mystery of the Shemitah. It's a seven-year mystery. You notice anything strange about the dates? 1973 to 1980, seven-year cycle. 1980, 1987, seven-year cycle. 2000, 2007, seven-year cycle. Every one of the collapses have happened in a seven-year cycle to the one before, the one after, every single one. And next puzzle piece, do any of these take place not just in a seven-year cycle, but in the actual appointed ancient biblical year of the Shemitah, the year of the release? The answer is yes. How many? Every single one of them. Every single collapse happened 100% at, on the year or at the time of the Shemitah appointed by God. Tishri is the most holy month of the Hebrew year, of the calendar. Tishri is the year of trumpets, Yom Kippur, tabernacles. Tishri is the month that opens up the Shemitah, and it's the month that closes the Shemitah. In fact, when that, when that wipeout day comes, Elul 29, when the sun sets, because that's when it comes, that is the, the moment everything's wiped out, and it ushers in Tishri. So Tishri's the month that manifests the repercussions of this wipeout. Now, I said, if you look at the single-day crashes, they can happen any time, any month of the year, any day of the year. It should be, is there any chance, or how many, or do any, of the top crashes take place in or, or clustered around the month of Tishri? It should be one out of 12. The answer is, the majority of greatest crashes in history, single day, happen all around the month of Tishri. Now that is against odds. Now for, for years, financial analysts have been mystified that if you notice, the greatest stock market crashes tend to take place in the autumn. And they've, for years, they couldn't figure it out. I mean, they still can. They'll say it was the farmers or it was this, and it, things change and it still keeps happening. Generally, around autumn, particularly September, October. Well, the answer's in the Bible. In the Bible, the month of Tishri is September, October, the very time that God appointed for the financial wipeout. In fact, if you look at the greatest three day crashes, percentage-wise, they are Black Monday, Great Depression, Black Tuesday, Great Depression, Black Monday, 1987. In Hebrew, their dates are Tishri 24, Tishri 25, and Tishri 26, all of them within two days in Tishri. In fact, the greatest percentage crashes, or the top ones, they, the majority happen within a two and a half week period of the whole year, only in two and a half weeks clustered around Tishri. Now what happens if instead of this we look at the greatest volume crashes, point crashes, magnitude crashes, not percentage, in history? Do any of them take place around the time of that wipeout day, Elul 29, and not just, not just once a year, but I mean the one Elul 29 that comes around only once every seven years of the appointed Shemitah. They can have, a crash can happen in any month, and can have any year within seven years, any time. If you look at the top five greatest point crashes in history, do any of them take place at that time, or around that time? The answer is, Every single one of them does. 
In fact, they're, they, if you take the percentage of how close they come to that day of wipeout or they follow it, the, the fifth greatest collapse, 99.6%. Fourth greatest, 97.5%. Third greatest, 100%. Second greatest, 993 and the first greatest, 100%. The average is 99.3% proximity to the day that's appointed to wipe out. But it gets even more stunning. And it's gonna, the, the phenomenon of the Shemitah has been increasing in the last 14 years. And I'm gonna share about that when, I, when we talk about the future as we get back to that. But it even, that's not it. It even gets bigger than that. The mystery is so big that it literally affects the rise and fall of nations. Shemitah, the Hebrew word means the release, but it can also mean the shaking, the fall, the collapse. In 586 BC, when the Shemitah, the judgment of the Shemitah comes on Israel, not only is Judah, the kingdom, wiped out, but it causes Babylon to rise. Babylon, which, which is used to destroy, is, is actually, it rises just at that time according to the mystery. It's got to be right at that time. And then Babylon falls and Persia rises, of course, because the 70 years are up. Even Babylon and Persia are linked to the timing of the Shemitah. So could the Shemitah be affecting world history to this day? and the rise and fall of empires or superpowers. Well, shaking. The greatest shaking in world history up to the beginning of the 20th century was the first world war, first world war in history, the war to end all wars. It was the shaking of nations. And the, the key turning point of that year was 1917 when America enters the war. And that, that 1917 is the year of the Shemitah. In that year, the, the you know, Shemitah means collapse, the Russian Empire collapses. Before the end of that war, the Austrian Empire will collapse, the German Empire will collapse, the Turkish Empire will collapse, collapsing of powers. And, but the Shemitah means null, it, it's about, it nullifies things. The Shemitah is also about the rise of nations. In that Shemitah, it's the beginning of the rise of America as a superpower. America enters the war, becomes the head of nations. And at that time, the British Empire reaches near bankruptcy. The financial center of the world moves from Britain and the old world to America in that war. And America becomes the greatest creditor nation in the world. World history changes with the Shemitah. But that brings us, what happens if we go four Shemitahs into the future from there? Fast forward, four, that's 28 years. Bring us to the Shemitah of the year 1945, another global cataclysm, World War II, the greatest cataclysm ever in world history. It reaches its peak in the year of the Shemitah. It actually begins, I mean, not, not before they declared war, Hitler begins the seizing of Europe by seizing Austria and Czechoslovakia in the year 1938, the conflict begins. 1938 is the year of the Shemitah. The war will last seven years, the years of the Shemitah. It will reach its crescendo with the final Shemitah, 1945. It involves the collapsing of powers again. European empires begin to collapse, and America begins its greatest rise. You know, the seven-year cycle of the Shemitah will end in the first week of September 1945. In that same week, the war, the Second World War, comes to its end. In fact, the war is sealed in September when the victorious allies have a victory procession sealing the war. It's the only procession they had at the very end of the war. They have it in Berlin, America, Russia. The day that they seal that, the day of this procession is Elul 29, the very day of the Shemitah. The Shemitah brings the rise and fall of powers, the collapse of the old world, the rise of America, even the Cold War. The rise, it, atomic, atomic, the atomic age begins as the Shemitah reaches its peak. And America becomes the superpower of the world in that Shemitah. A new world order begins with that Shemitah. A new financial order called Bretton Woods, where the entire, where all across the world, the economies, the currencies are based on the American dollar. The Shemitah, though, also means the fall. 
If one goes four Shemitahs later, 28 years to the next one, it brings to a, us to a different kind of fall. It brings us to the year 1973, just as crucial. That year, America makes a fateful decision to legalize the killing of its unborn children. That same month, that same month, in the financial realm, it collapses. That same year, Bretton Woods, the world order based on the dollar, collapses. That same year, America, the world's preeminent superpower, suffers its first defeat in modern history, if not ever, as it loses the war in Vietnam. And the day it loses the war in Vietnam is the exact same day it won the war in the Second World War. The day in the other Shemitah, the day of its greatest victory becomes the day of its defeat. What happens if we move four more Shemitahs into the future? It takes us to the year 2001. What happens then? The word Shemitah means collapse, means fall. As the Shemitah reaches its peak of 2001, its last week, the week that is heading to Elul 29, the week of nullification, wipeout, as it reaches its peak, comes 9-11 in that week. The Shemitah means collapse, the towers collapse, the towers representing America's preeminence collapse. Now there's so much that we don't have time for, including one mystery called the mystery of the towers that's in the book. But I will just say this concerning it. There's an ancient biblical mystery connecting the rising of towers and the rise of power or nations. The Hebrew word for tower is the word migdal. Migdal comes from the Hebrew root gadal, which means greatness. It means ex exaltation. It can even mean pride. In fact, in Isaiah 9:10, those who know the harbinger, when that, that vow of arrogance is going to be spoken, Isaiah says they say this in pride and arrogance. The word for arrogance is godel, which is linked to the word for tower, where they say we will rebuild, and we talked about that tower going up. It's even in the Hebrew. Well, there's a link and a mystery that the rising of great towers is linked to power. Well, let me share this. At the moment of America's greatest supremacy, 1945, towers over everything, a tower is conceived which is going to represent America's greatness. And that tower is called the World Trade Center. It is, it is conceived in the year of the Shemitah. Its construction begins much later in 1966. 1966 is the year of the Shemitah. It is built for seven years, the seven years of the Shemitah. It is finished and opens in the year 1973. 1973 is the year of the Shemitah. And it's destroyed in the year 2001, the year of the Shemitah. It is, it is, the, now what's the link? Towers speak of greatness, power rising. But the Shemitah means the fall. It speaks of the humbling of nations and the humbling of powers. And so it happens all according to this. In fact, you know, America, ever since it became the world's strongest economic power, but the American age of towers just came to an end a number of years ago. It has been surpassed by Asia. The Shemitah speaks, gives a warning. And if the rise of towers speaks of the rising of nations, what does the fall of a tower speak of? The nations, what it warns is, a nation's blessing and prosperity comes from God alone. And if the nation drives God out of its life and defies and blasphemes God, those blessings cannot remain. The crown of America, I've said this for as long as I've been speaking about the Harbinger, the crown of America, it has worn as the head of nations, if it does not turn back to God, that crown will be removed. Now there's so much, I'm going to share an end time mystery here. The, the Shemitah is linked to the end times. I mean, look, think about the seven year tribulation, seven years, Shemitah. The 70 years, the 77s of Daniel, Shemitahs. But I want to share this mystery here. It comes at the end of the book, and it's called The Mystery of the Seventh Shemitah. And that is this. When you, when you had every seventh year was a Shemitah, Sabbath year. Every seven Shemitahs was the seventh Shemitah opens up the Jubilee. The Jubilee is based on the Shemitah. The Jubilee is really, you can't understand the Jubilee without the Shemitah. A Jubilee is a mega super Shemitah. Dirt, that's my own invention. <laughs> during the, during the, the Jubilee, 
prisoners are released, and most uniquely, if you lost your land on the Jubilee, it was restored to you. Whatever you lost, you lost your ancestral possession, your father's house, it was restored on the Jubilee, you came back. It says everyone shall return to his father's possession, to your ancestral land, restoration, Jubilee restoration. Now we don't know when the Jubilee is, but we, because there's a gap in the, in the ancient celebration of it, but we do know when the Shemitah is. And we do know that the Jubilee has to take place in the year following the Shemitah, because the seventh Shemitah ushers in the Jubilee. Could there be a mystery here, an end time mystery here that the Shemitah reveals concerning a prophetic Jubilee? The link is the restoration of what has been lost. The year is, sept is in Hebrew, September 1916 to September 1917, that is the year of the Shemitah. The year following that Shemitah begins September 1917 to September 1918. That's the period. Could there be a restoration in that time? The answer is yes, and an amazing one. You see, for 2,000 years, the Jewish people were driven from their land. 2,000 years, they had no land. They lost their father's possession. But now, in the, but something happens. World War I, we, I mentioned this, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which had ruled the land of Israel for 400 years, Muslim, was not favorable to the Jewish people. In that war, to end all wars, the Ottoman Turkish Empire in this year begins to collapse. The British Empire enters the Middle East, enters Jerusalem. Now there was a little boy in England in the 19th century, and he prayed every night. His mother said, when you end your prayers, always pray, Lord, restore your ancient people to their ancient land, Israel. Little boy. Well, now it's 19, the year is 1917, and the British Empire is marching in under the reign of General Allenby. He takes the land, he actually, he's using a Bible as, he, as his guide as he enters the Middle East. And actually, as he enters Jerusalem, the people have fled. The, the enemies fled because they heard Allenby was coming, but they took it, they, mis, they misheard it as Allah Navi, the prophet of Allah, who was coming to bring judgment. So when he got there, they were gone. And so he, he got to Jerusalem, and he got off his horse because his Lord entered on a donkey, so he enters Jerusalem. And Jerusalem comes, and Israel for the first time comes under the British Empire, which for the first time under a power that is favorable to the Jewish people in 2,000 years. General Allenby was the little English boy who prayed every night, Lord, restore your people to their land. God used him to do it. When did it take place? It took place in, the, in November of 1917. It, Britain issues the Balfour Declaration saying, we will restore the land of Israel or Palestine back then will become, will be a Jewish homeland. For the first time, it's the restoration. When does that take place? It takes place in that exact period of the year following the Shemitah, the year that would be Jubilee. And what is it? It's that everyone, Israel is going to be restored to their father's land. They're going to come back to the land they lost. They're coming back to their inheritance, their ancestral land in that year. Now what happens? If you take that year and you fast forward seven Shemitahs into the future for the next, quote, Jubilee, could there be another Jubilee? Could there be another restoration? Where does it take you? If you take that Shemitah, go seven Shemitahs, the seventh Shemitah begins September 1965 and September 1966. The year of restoration would be September 1966 to September 1967. Does that sound familiar? June 7, 1967, Israeli soldiers in the Six-Day War, Israel is surrounded, the Arab world, or much of it says we're going to destroy them and drive them into the sea. The Six-Day War happens miraculously. Israel told Jordan, stay out of the war. We don't want to attack. Jordan had the biblical city of Jerusalem. Israel had the land, but they did not have Jerusalem, their ancient possession. But they said, stay out. Jordan joins in to attack them. June 7th, Israeli soldiers enter through the lion's gate. 
and they enter for the first time in 2,000 years, Israeli soldiers are walking the streets of Jerusalem. They enter to the mount, the temple mount, to the western wall, and there some of them are weeping. And Jerusalem, for the first time, is restored to the Jewish people in 2,000 years. When did it take place? It took place in the exact time period, the year following the seventh Shemitah. I mean, here they are, here you have the two restorations of the land, and they are, one is 1917, one is 1967, 50 years jubilee. The Lord said, I will not return until you, Jerusalem, you say, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai. Blessed is he, until the Jewish people, they had to survive for 2,000 years for that to come true. They had to come back to Israel for that to come true. They had to come back to Jerusalem, because that's where they're going to meet him. So it happens in the year following the Shemitah, the prophetic Jubilee. In fact, what do you do when the Jubilee comes? What did God say you do? It says you will sound the trumpet, except he didn't say sound the trumpet, he said sound the shofar. They sound the shofar. What the first thing when the Israeli soldiers get to the wall, the first thing that happens at that moment is the sounding of the shofar there. And it's done by a man named Rabbi Shlomo Goren, the most famous sounding of a shofar in modern times. Interesting. Rabbi Shlomo Goren was born in the year 1917, this year of the Jubilee, and on the, in 1967, he was 50 years old, it was his Jubilee, and he was the one who sounded the shofar. But now, you know, that would be enough. I mean, I'd be satisfied. I could go home right now. I'd be satisfied. But you know, that would be enough, and God could just keep it right there. And that's enough that it happened exactly this way. It's the mystery of the Shemitah taken to its prophetic end time realm. But does God have to do something again? No, he doesn't. But I'm throwing this out. He doesn't have to. It doesn't have to go into the next cycle. But for, for theoretical purposes, when is the next seventh Shemitah? If you start from 1965 and 66, go fast forward seven Shemitahs. It brings you to the, this year called 2014. It begins in, the, in September 2014. It goes to September 2015. We'll talk more about that. And the year following would be September 2015 to September 2016. It doesn't now, it might, doesn't have to happen. God doesn't have to continue it. But just to be aware, if it does follow, the pattern is there is always war in the Middle East, war in Israel. But it results in a prophetic restoration. Restoration. Now, I'm going to bring this now to where we are, to our day, and things to come. I mentioned earlier that the phenomenon of the Shemitah is increasing, is intensifying. Now, there's a critical reason, I believe, for this, because America has been progressing, along with much of the Western world, but has been progressing in an apostasy away from God. And so the sign of judgment, the Shemitah takes the sign of judgment now. The Harbinger reveals there are two shakings, recent shakings of America. One is 9-11, and the other is the collapse of Wall Street and our economy, the Great Recession. The first shaking takes place in the year 2001. The second takes place in the year 2008. That's a seven-year cycle. The collapse of Wall Street happens in September 2008. That's a seven-year cycle to the month of 9-11. It happens in the second week of September 2008. That's seven years to the week of 9-11. In fact, America was commemorating the seventh year of 9-11, while on Wall Street, the second shaking was being set in motion right then. And it reaches its peak on the, on the day September 29th, 2008, they enter the New York Stock Exchange, and they ring the opening bell, but the opening bell that day refuses to ring. Even Wall Street took it as a sign. That day comes the greatest point magnitude crash in world history. On what day did the greatest collapse take place in world history? It took place on Elul 29, the wipeout day of the Bible that God appointed from ancient times to strike the financial realm of a nation. And here as a warning, a nation that has driven God out of its life, 
on the very day, in the very hours. It's got to take place before sunset of that day. It happens, it's finished in late afternoon, just when the Shemitah. In fact, there are Orthodox Jews in Israel who are still that moment where, where symbolically canceling out their debts to each other while on Wall Street literally was being wiped out as sunset approached. And just as mind-boggling, according to the mystery, it's seven years. So what happens if you take that moment of that greatest crash and you go back seven years, where does it bring you? It brings you to September 2001. You have the month of 9-11, but something else. That same month, you have the other greatest collapse in Wall Street history. That same month. It's, like it's caused by 9-11. And when did that take place? It took place September 17th, 2001. Now that's close. That's seven years within two weeks. That's close. But if you strip the Western calendar it, and, you put, and you go back to the Hebrew biblical God's calendar, the other greatest collapse took place on the same exact biblical day of Elul 29, the day of the wipeout. And not just any Elul 29, each one took place on the once every seven years day. Only comes once in seven years. To the exact day, I mean, just get that. The two greatest collapses in history up to those days each happened on the same exact biblical day that just happens to be appointed to do that very thing, to wipe out the financial realm. And they, they according to the mystery, it's got to be seven years apart. Well, the two greatest collapses in, in Wall Street history to those days each take place exactly seven Hebrew biblical years apart, down to the date, down to the hour, down to the minute, down to the second, and down to the closing bell. Only God could do that. Because every collapse... I mean, every, everything that happens, it, it involves everybody's interaction, everybody's investing, everybody's removing, everything is part of it, which is telling you that he's in control of everything. And in fact, the first collapse in 2001 was actually caused by 9-11, so it means even 9-11 had to happen according to the ancient mystery. And could it gone, and, and you know, the, the Shemitah is, is about the number seven. Could there be the sign or the mark of the number seven in these things? Well, not only are they seven years apart, not only do they happen in the beginning of the seventh month, not only at the, at the crowning day of the seventh year, but in 2001, how much is wiped out? How much percent of Wall Street? Seven percent. How much is wiped out in that day in 2008? Seven percent. How many points were wiped out in 2008? Greatest crash? Seven, seven, seven. 777. The Shemitah is it gives a prophetic, it's a prophetic warning to such a nation that a means a fall or to let allow collapse or allow a fall that America's blessings are from God. Without God, there's no blessing. And America cannot war against the God of its foundation and have its blessings remain. And I've, I've said this when I've shared the harbinger from the day it came out, that Ameri America doesn't return, that the American age as we know it will fall, which brings us now to the future. The next Shemitah has begun. What lies ahead? First caution. I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't, set, I don't want to set dates where God has not set dates. God doesn't have to do anything in the Shemitah. When you put God in a box, he's very good at getting out of it. The mystery doesn't have to manifest every cycle. It can be lesser or greater. But the second caution is, God can do it as he's done it. And God can do it according to his timing, according to this timing. I'm not saying he has to, but he can. I don't set dates. The book does contain dates. But to be aware of, if the, the phenomenon of the Shemitah, if it is going to manifest in this cycle that just began, the pattern is, the general pattern is this. When it opens up, it generally opens up very subtly, and you don't see much until it approaches its end, the peak, the intense, the nullification time. When the last one happened, 2007, you wouldn't have noticed much, except something did happen. The, within one month of the Shemitah beginning, Wall Street that had been rising since the last Shemitah, since the last crash, suddenly reverses its momentum within a month 
and begins a descent that gets more stronger and stronger until you have the complete collapse at the end of the Shemitah. But on the very first day of that Shemitah of 2007, when it began, you had something else. Something happened in England that was a foreshadow. You had a first, a, a first fruit. You had the first bank run and collapse in England in over 100 years, the collapse of Northern Rock, which is a foreshadow of the collapses that would happen at the end. So where are we now? Well, did anything happen? We are only a few weeks from the very beginning. The stock market has been rising since the collapse of the last Shemitah from 2009. It has been rising and rising. In the last week of September, the markets, if you've been watching, began to reel. They began to sway violently. They, it said there's a return of fear to the markets. Violent swings and, the, and descending and descending. It began the week of September 22nd to September 26th. Anything about that week? That week just happens to be the very start of the Shemitah. As the Shemitah began, Wall Street began to tremble and sway violently. And the peak collapse of that opening week was September 25th. September 25th was the opening day of the Shemitah. Now, this does not have to, there's two things that can happen. One is it can continue as, as so, collapsing, or two, it can be a first fruit as it was in the last one, a foreshadow of what will happen greater at the end. If this is only the beginning, someone said to me, said, well, you know, you know the, the market that day, there's one of these days, one of those days it collapsed like 330 points in one day. So that's half of 700. So maybe it'll be half as, whatever's happening, well, maybe it'll be half as severe. I said, no, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing the opening of this one to the closing of that one. It is, this is the most dramatic opening there's ever been to a Shemitah. Now, whether it, be, it continues or whether it is a foreshadow, there is, a, there is reason to believe there is something much greater coming. Now, something else happened in the first days or weeks of the Shemitah. Now, I've warned about this for years, and I've said it a few times here. Something happened that was monumental, and most people missed it. The crown that America has borne in the book, in the Mystery of the Shemitah, it gives the year when it began. 1871, America becomes the strongest power on earth. It's linked to the rise of a tower. We won't go into it. But in that year, ever since then, America's been the strongest economic nation in the world. In the first days or weeks of the Shemitah, that crown was removed. For the first time, this age of America being the strongest economic power on earth came to an end. It was eclipsed by the nation of China. And this is just the beginning. I believe God wants his people to be prepared. That's one reason why I wrote the book. First sign, the phenomenon is intensifying. Second sign, America's apostasy from God is deepening, quickening, and intensifying. Just in the past few weeks, America's ending of the biblical definition of marriage went from 19 states to 32 states. I would keep my eye on that as well. Because if that keeps going, there's going to come a day when every state or the Supreme Court will rule, and that's going to be another critical point. In Houston, if you didn't hear, and I was at the, I was at the church, of I spoke at one of the churches of, of the pastor involved, the government demanded that pastors hand over their sermons, their emails, their private communication, it, wherever they spoke against homosexuality. It is a new day. Third phenomenon, the, the Shemitah is combined now converging with the phenomenon of the harbingers which have not stopped. I'm going to throw this in. I didn't plan on this originally. I just, I'm going to throw this in. The second harbinger in the book is the sign of the terrorist. And that is when Israel got its first warning strike. When the first warning strike came in 732 BC, the ones who did it were the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are noted in history as the people who invented what is called terrorism. They are the world's first terrorist. So that Isaiah 9:10 template is linked to a strike of terrorism. And the thing is, now, now, 
In America, 9-11, you have a strike of terrorism. The people who do it are also from the Middle East, as the Assyrians were. The Assyrians carried out their attack on Israel in the language of Akkadian. The closest language today to Akkadian, the sister language, is Arabic. So the attack of 9-11 was carried out in the sister language of the Assyrians. And here you have this again, but the, but the template or the pattern is this with Israel. I'm not saying it has to happen exactly according to, but just to be aware that, that the, the pattern is this. Those who brought that first attack on Israel, that warning strike, are the same ones who years later are going to be responsible for the great calamity that comes, the judgment that comes on the nation. God allows them. He's against them, but he allows them. The same people who did that first strike, the Assyrians, Israel gets involved in another conflict with them, and comes this massive judgment. Well, knowing this, I was always wondering if America would get involved again with a war on terrorists. And then came ISIS. 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 ISIS comes from Al-Qaeda. They're an offshoot from the same people who brought us 9-11. They come from the Middle East, of course. But ISIS, they actually, they claim, what's the land they're claiming? Syria and Iraq. Well, do you know, Syria and Iraq was the core land of the Assyrian Empire. Mo there is even more than Al-Qaeda, they may very likely have the blood of the Assyrians in them. The Assyrians were known for being cold-blooded, so ISIS. The Assyrians mutilated their victims, innocent people, so does ISIS. The Assyrians were especially known for beheading their victims. ISIS is known for beheading its victims. The Assyrians, when they would be head decapitate their victims, they would put it on public display. ISIS puts their beheading on public display. I was in the Capitol building on, in September. I was there with members of Congress, and we were praying, praying for America. We were in the Senate chamber praying for America. We were in the rotunda praying for America. That night, from the White House, President Obama spoke to the nation and said, we are basically at a war with ISIS now. Here comes the re-engagement with, with those ancient people. He says it, and, he, and the eve, the day, it was the eve of 9-11 when he says it. And he mentions two, two events, and it's in, the, it's in the harbinger, but he mentions two events. He says, this is now 13 years, from a paraphrasing, from this calamity when we were shaken, 9-11. 13 years. Then he says, and we are now six years from the other shaking. I'm paraphrasing, but he says six years. He's talking about the economic collapse. Between 13 years and six years is a seven-year cycle. You go one more seven-year cycle, and the six years becomes seven, and the 13 years becomes 14, two sevens. One year from now. Interesting, because one year from when he said this, just about, we're entering the peak day of the Shemitah. And he says, basically, we were shaken, but he says, but we are going to be, we're going to come out of this bigger, you know, the same thing, Isaiah 9, 10. He says it on that day. Now, I spoke this morning about the fourth harbinger in the book, the tower. That tower is the remain, the one remaining harbinger that is still not finished, and it is the embodiment of that vow of defiance and that led to destruction of Israel, now America. That tower is the, the embodiment. In fact, we shared this morning that the president actually wrote a paraphrase of the vow on the tower. It began, when did that tower begin? It began in the year of the Shemitah. It began when Tom Daschle, the Senate Majority Leader, said, we will rebuild, and he's quoting from Isaiah 9-10. That tower was begun by Isaiah 9-10. On the second inauguration of the president, which was a very, which was a real turning point. You know, you reach a turning point, you know what happens? It's like pushing something over. You push it over, you reach the, the tipping point, the tipping point, and it starts accelerating. Things are accelerating in America. And so he was reelected. 
It was a day I was in Washington, I was asked to speak at something called the Presidential Inaugural Prayer Breakfast. And I, 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 they, I said, what do you want me to speak about? It was Christians who, who were there and, and leaders were there. And they said I, I said, I said, you want me to pray like for a minute or something? They said, no, we want you to speak. I said, really? I said, how much time do I have? They said, how much time do you want? I said, wow. I said, what can I speak about? They said, well, how about the harbinger? I said, okay, I'll do it. So on the day of his inauguration, I'm giving this word there in Washington. The president is, is sworn in and he chooses a poet to give, to give the poetic whatever. The guy, it's whatever is the right word for it. The guy he chooses, he, sing, he gives a praise, a thanksgiving kind of hymn, not to God, but to the works of our hands. And then he speaks of the harbinger. He boasts of the works of our hands. And then he says he speaks of the tower. He says in that last floor, going up of that tower that juts into the sky, the sky or the heaven that yields to our resilience. It basically was Isaiah 9, 10 in the form of that. Now, in the Bible, when the sun is darkened, it was a sign of judgment. Now, I'm not saying that every time the sun is darkened, it means judgment. It's a natural phenomenon. And in the Bible, it speaks of an apocalyptic phenomenon. However, it, does, the, the, it says these are for signs. It, it can be a sign. This, this past year, they tried to put the spire on the tower to, to get it to its height. And the first time they tried it, the winds blew and prevented them from doing it. But then finally, they got that spire up and crowned the tower. The day that they did that, the sun was darkened, a solar eclipse. Now, people have asked me about the blood moons, even here. And I'm not being dogmatic about what's significant or what's not. However, I will say this. The period of the blood moons is one and a half years. The first half year is already gone. The rest of the period is going to be the year of the Shemitah. It's all converging, and I shared this morning how one of the harbingers actually heralded that same day that the first period, the blood moon began. Something to note. In the year 2015, the Shemitah, the majority of the Shemitah, the sun will be darkened two times. The first will be in the spring. The sun will be darkened on the exact day that marks the exact center point day of the Shemitah. The sun will be darkened. And then one more time, guess what day? It will be darkened on max day, the day of wiping out. The last time that happened, I mean, forget about it. If you know someone was not a believer at all, the last time that happened was in 1987. The eclipse happened on Elul 29. That ushered in Black Monday, which was the greatest percentage collapse in stock market history. Now, does a collapse have to happen at this time? No. It could happen before, after, around. Doesn't have to happen at all, but... On the other hand, I would take note. I would be ready. When Elul 29 comes this year, it falls on Sunday, not on a stock market day. However, the last day that the stock market is open has an interesting date. The date is 9-11. And it may also point to a greater shaking than financial, that only financial. What might the Shemitah bring if, if something is going to happen? The Shemitah causes the worldly realm to be shaken, to fade, to collapse. It affirms that God is the only thing that remains, that God is sovereign over everything. It humbles the pride of man and the pride of nations. It can cause the fall of nations, even the fall of superpowers. Now, whether it happens during this Shemitah or not, I believe a great shaking is coming to America and the world. And this shaking will involve the collapse of the financial realm, the collapse of the economic realm, and will not necessarily be confined to those realms. Just like 9-11 caused the collapse, but it was a bigger event than financial. But the point of the Shemitah and the point of shaking is to cause those who will hear to return to the Lord, to repent, to be saved, and those who know the Lord to awake. You see, I've shared before, you know, most of us who are saved came to the Lord because there was some shaking in our life. So don't despise shaking. It is also true with nations. When people say, well, if there's shaking, how can there be hope? I say it's the opposite. America has grown so deafened to God that it may take a shaking. 
for America to hear the voice of God. Remember the Lord says on the day of judgment, he says, the mountains and hills shall be cast down, but the valleys shall be lifted up. That he will, he will humble the exalted, but he will exalt the humble. The point here is, you know, the, that the name of God be lifted up. If a great shaking is coming, how do we prepare? Well, is there, should we do, should, should we do practical things in the world? Well, I am not a financial analyst, but I would say this, and don't quote me, but I would, we're, we're, we're on satellite, but don't quote me. <laughs> but I would say, if I had money in the stock market, I wouldn't feel safe about it as we approach. I would go for safety, as a, and I would avoid risk in these realms. Is it wise to have a store of essential things around, whether food and other things that are essential, in case there are times of chaos? Yes, it, the Bible says a wise man prepares. It is wise. And not just to have for yourself, but to bless other people. It is wise. Listen, you can't go wrong. The worst case scenario, if there's no worst case scenario, you got food. <laughs> Most important, mo what is the safest place to be? Is it New York City? I think you think not. <laughs> is it San Francisco? Probably not. Is it here in the desert? Not necessarily. I will share that, you know what the word in Hebrew for desert is midbar. And you know, midbar comes from the word dabar, which means to speak. God speaks in the desert. But I will say this, that's even not the safest place. The safest place to be is to be in the will of God. Make sure you're in the will of God. We are standing at a critical point in history and what may be prophecy, I'm asked, I shared this in the morning, what does the future hold, judgment or revival? I answer it can be both. I'm led to continually say that. What does it tell you? If the hour is late, take your time more seriously. And again, the time for getting right is not tomorrow, it's today. And I have to say this, I said it before, but it's so important. If there's anything in your life that has to get out, get it out today. Don't say tomorrow. Take a step today. We sing, we sang it today. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah. And we think, hey, great. But you know what? The days of Elijah were days of persecution when a nation that once knew God turned against the people of God. These are the days of Elijah when the people of God have to hold true and hold strong no matter what. The darkness is removing its grays. It's becoming more radical for evil. So then it's time for the light to remove it, our grace, to become all out for God. If these are the days of Elijah, we must become the Elijahs of the day. And challenge the world around us. Say, if Baal is God, serve him. But if the Lord is God, serve him. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. We have the call of Elijah. We must take up the mantle of Elijah. To be bold and uncompromised and on fire, come what may, no matter what, come hell or high water, we will stand for God. Whatever is not grounded in God shall be shaken. Whatever can be shaken will be shaken. Ground yourself all the more on the word of God. It is time to ground yourself more. Do not bend the word of God to fit your life. Bend your life to fit the word of God. It is time to be more independent of the world and more plugged into God. It's going to be crucial in the days ahead to be in prayer, consecration, in quiet time with God. Decide that no matter what happens, no matter what the majority does, no matter what the government does, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price, you will stand with God. You have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind you, the cross before you, though none go with you, still you follow. Do not fear. God does not give us a spirit of fear. If you are outside of God, I said it before, fear. All, go ahead and fear and get inside God. Get in his will. But if you are in God's will, do not fear. When I said, I said this, I'm going to say it again. How can you be safe? The word, remember, if you remember, can only know one, you know several Hebrew words, but if you only know one Hebrew word, know this one. The word for safety is Yeshua, and Yeshua is Jesus. He is our safety. He is our rock. He is our rock. If you're in God, get more in God. 
What does the Shemitah tell us? It tells us that no matter what it looks like, no matter what is going on around you, God is in control. No matter what trouble is in your life, God is in control. No matter what comes against you, God is still in control. If you are in his will, do not fear. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole wide world in his hand. He's got you and me, babies, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hand. The one who is on God's side is, remember, is on the winning side, no matter what. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but the word of our God shall not be shaken. The name of our God shall not be shaken. Not even hell can stop the will of God. These are the times that produce the greatest believers. The apostles lived in days which were filled with darkness, filled with godlessness, and yet they blazed and changed the world. The latter days, mystery, the latter days shall be as the former days. You had Israel, you got Israel again. You had Jerusalem and Jewish hands, you got it again. You had Jewish believers, we're back. You had... <laughs> it's a fact. It's a fact. And you had people of the church from all nations who loved Israel, you're back. You're back. That has not been for ages. So the latter days will be as the beginning days of the age. The book of Acts, live as they lived, believe as they believed, dare to believe as they believed, as if you were a book of Acts. Overcome as they did. Though shaking may come, I believe it absolutely will come, but from that can come revival and awakening. You want prophecy? You've got it. You want Bible days? You're in it. You want the end times? You see it. You want the days of Elijah? You've got it. Live like Elijah. You want the book of Acts? You're getting it. Live like an apostle. Don't live on the defense. This kingdom is never on the defense. Even if it looks like it, never. It is always on the offense, always advancing. It is time to get realer, more serious with God. Time to get all out for God more than you have before, and God will lift you up to a higher place. And when you look at the days ahead, remember this. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, because his name is the Almighty. All hell has come against the kingdom of God. All hell has tried to wipe out the Jewish people. Do you know that? For 4,000 years, the pharaohs tried to stamp out the people of God. Assyria tried to wipe them out. Babylon tried to destroy them. Rome tried to crush them. Hitler tried to annihilate them. But, 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 Egypt has fallen. Assyria is no more. Babylon is dust. Rome has perished. Hitler is gone. They have all fallen. But the nation of Israel lives. The Am Yisrael Hai. The nation of Israel lives because the God of Israel lives. Because the Messiah of Israel lives. Because Yeshua HaMashiach lives. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against his people. If you'll live in his will, you'll prevail. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, same yesterday, today, and forever. He remains the light of this world. He remains the glory of Israel. He remains the lion of the tribe of Judah. He remains the king of all. Live for his glory. Live on fire. Be strong and of good courage, people of God. And in his power, you shall overcome the world. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We bless you. Let's praise the Lord tonight. We praise you, Father. We bless you. You are here. You are real. You are awesome. You are here, and we, your people praise you. We shout for you. We praise you. We lift up your name today here in Joshua Springs. We praise your name. We praise you, Lord. Father, we commit ourselves to you, all out for you, total for you, Lord. Help us all to live on fire to live to fulfill the calling you gave us when you put us in our mother's womb oh lord have your way we commit to you that's what we yearn for that's what we cry out for you know our frame you know our mistakes you know our falling on our face but lord we love you and we ask that your spirit would have its way in our life and we, you would cause us to walk in your way and walk to the highest call, nothing less, that we would be your vessels on earth. We would be filled with your power, 
filled with your glory and overcoming no matter what until our call is finished. We praise you. Have your way with each of your people here tonight and bless them. We thank you for your presence in Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.